Who here is a fan of birthdays? Put your hand up. Oh, quite a few. All right. Who doesn't like birthdays? Keep your hand up. There's four of us. Awesome. Excellent. Five of us. <laughs> like, birthdays can just be another day, can't they? Right? To some people, birthdays have a meaning of pretty much not much at all. And it's like it's just another day, it's another year, let's get on with life. And, um, and to others, some people like to have a birthday week where you celebrate me for a week. It's birthday week, guys. What day were you born? Doesn't matter, it's birthday week. Come on. It's time to celebrate me. And we all have different opinions and ideas of what birthdays can and should look like. Some people like lots of presents. Not pointing my finger at anyone in particular. (laughs) And um, some people don't really care if they get a present. They just want company of people around them. Um, But birthdays look different to everyone. Where are you going with this, Pastor Tim, you say? Because what's that got to do? It's not Christmas time, we've had Easter, and here we are celebrating birthday. Well, I've just celebrated a birthday, and no, I didn't want to do it for that. <laughs> and I'm really not interested in birthdays. Like, birthdays for me um, are pretty much non event. I just have them for the kids because the kids get excited and they want to give me stuff. So, but I'm happy just to let a birthday go and move on. My 40th birthday party was huge consisted of myself and my family that was about it because I just I'm not I don't want the fuss but that's me personally and I respect that everyone is completely different in that and as I was reflecting on my birthday coming up and reflecting on this message so everyone has a different idea of what a birthday should look like but there's no right or wrong answer is there really because you can do whatever it's your birthday that's the freeing part of it. how good's that and as we've been disco- going through and discovering the life of Paul, um, last week Pastor Paul introduced us to justification and, and I thought, well, what then is justification and, and how do we view justific- justification in its true light and in its true self and, and, and what does that really, really look like to us? And to understand that, we really need to dive into the Apostle Paul's life and understand what, who he was before he was Paul, when he was Saul, known as Saul. And, and we did that, didn't we? Yeah. Right? We've been all through that. And this is the reason why we're at where we are now is because of everything that we've been going through over the last 18 months has brought us to this point. Cool, hey. Yeah. Huh? I just had a light bulb moment just this week going, oh, isn't it funny how God had us come to this point now and we've spent the last 18 months over all these topics to bring us to justification who we are well, that's really cool anyway that was just my little up over moment so just a quick recap on Saul's history um, the apostle Paul he was obviously a Pharisee the Pharisee of all Pharisees he knew scripture better than you and I combined right he could recite the Old Testament can, can anyone here recite the Old Testament anyone I'm not putting my hand up because there's no way oh my goodness these guys they could recite the Torah just blows my mind because I just have res- trouble remembering when my birthday is that's why I have kids so they tell me <laughs> let's all stand for the word shall we uh, I'm going to read from Galatians to begin with just in honour of God's amazing word that he's given us <clears throat> Galatians 3 7 to 9 if you've got your Bibles you can turn there with me otherwise you can just follow along on the screen Understand then that those who have faith are children of Abraham. Scripture foresaw that God would justify the Gentiles by faith and announce the gospel in advance to Abraham. How cool is that? You may be seated. Right, again, when we are coming around letters that Paul wrote, let's remember who Paul was before he was Paul, when he was known as Saul, because he knew Old Testament scripture like the back of his hand. So when he's talking here and he's saying that understanding that those that have faith are children of Abraham, he's re- referring back to scripture in Genesis 12 to 15. And Paul would quite often, he would just quote one thing in his letters, but he's actually meaning to go and read the whole thing. That's one thing that I've just learned about the Apostle Paul. I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. So anytime now I find 
a scripture that he refers to, then it takes me ages because I'm going to go read all this stuff. But he just knew it. So that's why, I mean, he didn't have to put it in there because in the context of when it was written, people knew what he was talking about. We don't necessarily, so we have to go and do all this extra reading and take all this extra time to find out what it is that it's actually talking about. Otherwise, we run in fear of taking the context out of the word out of context, which is super, super dangerous. It leads us down all sorts of garden paths that we shouldn't be on. So when Paul's saying this, this is just, this is a massive, massive moment, right? Those who have faith are now children of Abraham. This is fulfilling the promise that God gave Abraham thousands and thousands and thousands of years ago before us, right? Are you a person of faith? Then you then are a child of Abraham, right? How cool is that? You're part of fulfilling this promise that God said thousands of years ago. Isn't that awesome? Right? So when we read this, we need to go, wow, that's us right here. Right? That God would justify the Gentiles by faith. Why was that such a, such, a, such a big thing? Because he was all about the Jews, wasn't he? He was a Pharisee. So he's all about upholding the law. And then all of a sudden he's had this encounter with the Messiah that he is the Christ. And oh my goodness, he then says, everything that I lived for and stood for is now rubbish in comparison to knowing Jesus. So when he now says that, Scripture foresaw that God would also justify the Gentiles. No wonder he ran to the Gentiles to bring him the word. Because he was a Pharisee, all about the law, all about the Jews and Israel. And and now all of a sudden he's had this encounter. He knows who the Messiah is and that the time has changed. The curtain's broken. The Gentiles are now allowed in. I'm going to go tell them. He announced in the gospel in advance to Abraham, which is just blows, just, I just love scripture. Just the whole story. We have to be aware of the whole story. And then goes on to say, all nations will be blessed through you. This is the scripture he's quoting here in Genesis 15. So those who rely on faith are blessed along with Abraham, the man of faith. That's you and me. How cool is that? Right, we are blessed because we are now in the family of Abraham. Hallelujah. I mean, and many of you know the song that you sung in kids' church, Father Abraham. I never got that opportunity. I got to sing it as a teenager. Um, but yeah, anyway, how cool is that? Uh, Genesis 12, 2 to 3, God says to Abraham, I will make you into a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. And I will bless those that bless you. And whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the people on the earth will be blessed through you. We are now part of that because of justification. We don't have to do anything to earn it. Every other religion, you have to do stuff to earn your right, to earn, to to be something. We don't. It's the coolest ever. We just rock up and in faith, we believe. Right, Just as Abraham believed by faith. He was an old man and God's told him this. He's got no kids. He's got every right to doubt God, doesn't he? But he doesn't. He believes God. And his belief is what was counted to him as righteousness. So therefore our belief in God. Because now we fall under that, that family of Abraham... And this is what Paul's talking about here. We now fall under this bigger, wider family that God spoke about thousands of years ago. This is who the Gentiles and all the Jews and everyone now comes in under because of the Messiah, because of what Jesus did. We now live as this family and we're now to be a blessing to the world. And those that bless us, God will bless. Right, Because we are now those people. And God will now bless us to be a blessing to the world. To show him the light and and who he is. Paul then writes in Romans 10, 9 to 13. If you declare with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Everyone's heard that, hey. And we go, oh, that's pretty simple, isn't it? We just believe in our heart, confess with our mouth. Woohoo, we're there. Is it really that simple? Because in today's day and age, to, we can say anything and say we believe anything, can't we? 
Whereas back here, when the scripture was written, you didn't need a contract, you had a verbal agreement. Your word was your binding agreement. What's, what's our word now? Well, now we have to have solicitors that write all these contracts for us that are 50, 100 pages long and people have to now sign their name because their word has meant nothing. So if our, in our society, our word is belittled in a sense, isn't it? Like the, the worth of it has just been crippled. Yet Jesus said that if you just declare, in, confess with your mouth that I am Lord, you'll get into heaven. And I've wrestled with this for years and years and years and gone, well, God, it, how can it be that simple when people can just say what they want? Well, back then, they didn't just say what they want. If they said something, they were forced to follow through with it. And at times, it would cost people their lives if they didn't go through with what they verbally confessed that they were going to be. We don't have that now. So I think... In Western culture, in, in the years, 2,000 years later after Jesus, we're in some pretty dangerous territory. And I brought it to the board a few weeks ago and just challenged them. And at the end of the meeting, we were all going, man, are we even saved? Yeah. Like, seriously? What it actually asks from us to, to say that we believe in God, believe in Jesus, believe that he's the risen Messiah, doesn't mean that it's just a wishy-washy I believe and it doesn't affect our life. To actually say I believe means that we no longer live. No longer. That we now have to be dead to ourselves and alive in Christ. Right? And I've got an, an analogy I want to use which is why well, I've got all my bits and pieces everywhere. So we can, we can be over here, right? And we can be viewing what the Bible tells us to do, but living our own life. And we go, oh, okay, yep, so I want to follow Jesus, so I'm going to tell people about Jesus. I'm going to stick that on myself. Yep, okay, and oh, and oh, you should be reading the Bible, so I'm going to stick that on myself as well. And I'm going to go about doing all the things that I want to do and live my life and work where I want to work and live where I want to live and be friends with all the people I want to be friends with and, and I need to be generous. So I'm going to make sure I, I give and, and, and be generous. And, and we can pick and choose things and try and apply it to our life, right? But that's not what believing in Christ looks like. Believing in Christ doesn't just go, I can pick and choose what I like, or you know, these things are hard and I don't know how I can do them all, and that's actually why we have to die to ourselves. And what we have to do is that we have to actually, Paul tells us all, all through scripture, right, all through new, lights are gone, oh, there they are, <laughs> all through um, his letters, he writes, I'm just going to take my shoes off, hey there's a thing there just in that, like you know, take your shoes off because then you can't walk where you want to walk and you're going to go to Jesus's costume here, right? We've got to be in Christ. So we've got to be out of ourselves and in Christ, if I can get into this thing. Uh. So we're going to leave our life behind and now we're going to be in Christ. And when we are in Christ, then we are all the things Christ is. Alright? It is like trying to put a on. <laughs> There we go. There we go. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> but we can't just apply those things to our life. We need to die to our life and be in Christ. That means that we take on his form. That means we take on everything he is. And no longer is it us that live, but it is him that lives in us. Does that make sense? There's, there's a huge distinction between the two. And we can, we can confess that we're a Christ follower and grab those things and apply them to our lives and walk around blindly thinking that we're going to make it to heaven. And I don't think we will. Because that's not how we're called to live. We're actually called to be in Christ and to die to ourselves. So our life can't matter anymore. Our life and our way of doing things has got to be laid down before him. Yes, we have gifts. 
gifts and talents that will be used for the kingdom to see the kingdom advance. Not our own kingdom advance, but his kingdom advance. And by stepping into his life in his way and having his mind. We're meant to have the mind of Christ, aren't we? We can only have the mind of Christ if we're in Christ. So we need to get out of our life and into his life. So what does his life look like then? But that's what it means to believe. We believe in the risen Lord. So in believing, we step out of our life and into his life. And then we study the word to find out how is it that you live Jesus. Then I live like that. And you know what? I'm going to make mistakes. And that's okay because I'm justified. I didn't have to do anything but believe. That was all I had to do. It was to leave my old way of living, come into my new creation, my new being, who I am now. That's it. Job done. Just in the process of I believe. Right? Old life gone, new life, new clothes. I'm a new creation, which we're going to get into next week. That makes sense? Yes. Hallelujah. For it is with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and are saved. As scripture says, anyone who believes in him will never be put to shame. For there is no difference between Jew and Gentile. The same Lord is Lord of all and richly blesses all who call on him. For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. We've got to leave the old life behind. We've got to leave the old life behind. It's so tempting to take this off and go back and just apply things to our life. And walk around blinded that we're doing the right thing. We've got to be clothed in Christ every day. Living as Christ would live. And he was all about building the kingdom. And and that's why Paul was all about upholding the law. Because the Jews had a job to do. So that's why he was so passionate about it. That This is the job that we've got to do guys. So we need to uphold this. So that's why the Pharisees brought in so many more rules and regulations. Was to try and uphold their way of doing things. To show the world who God was. And they still failed. You know what? We're still going to fail. And that's okay. Because there's no condemnation when we're in Christ. There is when we're out of Christ. So if you feel look where you're positioning yourself get into Christ and you have no condemnation because in Christ you're justified you're saved you're forgiven you're set free right so when you make a mistake you repent and yes your repentance means that your heart felt I'm sorry but then you can bounce back up again because you're justified because you're forgiven you're now righteous before God because of what Jesus has done you didn't have to do anything apart from say sorry it's great some people really struggle to say sorry but that's what we have to do and mean it. It's just like when we believe, we've got to mean what we believe. Our word has to be binding. Has to be. We have to get, we have to remove ourselves from this world where our word can mean anything to where our word is binding before God. Galatians 2.20 I have been crucified with Christ and I no longer live but Christ lives in me. The life I now live in the body I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Again Paul saying it's no longer me that's living. It's not uh, I've seen the Messiah. It's finally happened. Everything we've been waiting for and longing for it's finally happened and it's here the time is now it's no longer I that live I now live because of Christ and in him I live I live by the faith of the son of God that connects us back to the, the our father Abraham and all the blessings that come with being part of that but all the responsibility that comes with that as well and in Philippians 1, 21, Paul says, For me, for to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Because he knows as long as he's on this earth, his mission is to be Christ. To live as Christ lived. To, to tell everyone of the good news of Jesus. And see people taught and lives changed and churches built. He did a great job of it, hey? 
But for him to die was to gain the most eternal, great position in heaven or with Jesus, wherever that may be, in our time to come. In Philippians 2, 12 to 13, he says, Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you to will and act in order to fulfill his good purpose. Not our good purpose of what it is that we want to achieve. His good purpose. And that only comes from that horrible word that people don't like of obedience. And it's stepping out of our life into his and obedience comes naturally. But we've got to believe. And when we believe, we're justified. When we believe, we're saved. When we believe, we're forgiven. When we're, we're washed clean. Sin no longer holds any power over us anymore. We are now part of Abraham's family. Part of the promise that God spoke to Abraham thousands of years ago. We're now part of that family. How cool is that? Isn't that exciting? 2 Corinthians, Paul then goes on to say that for we all must appear before the judgment seat of Christ so that each of us may receive what is due for us for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. We've got to be really careful that we don't fall into a position where we think we can earn our salvation. If we've got this off and we're just applying these things to our lives, right? then we'll go to a place where we go, oh, now I've got to do things to earn my salvation which is completely wrong because we don't have to do anything because we're justified. If we truly believe, then we don't have, we have to stop doing. Oh, but we can't stop doing because actually we're going to be judged for the life that we live. Now, Paul doesn't just say this here, right? He says it in several places. He also makes reference to it in Romans uh, chapter 14, Galatians 5, 1 Corinthians 3 and 6, and there's many other places where Paul brings warning to the churches on how you're living. You are one day going to stand before the judge and be judged for what you did to build the kingdom. And often we, we miss that. We don't like to hear that because you go, hang on, judgment, what's this judgment coming upon us? We're going to be washed clean. Yes, you are. You are washed clean of your sin, but now you have a job to do. Just like the Israelites. We look back at the Israelites and go, they had a job to do and they failed. How are we any different? Are we being just as good as what they were? Man, sometimes I think I'm worse than what the Israelites were. But we've got a job to do. And the job is part of being in this new body, this new creation, this new family that we're now part of to show the world who Jesus Christ is. We're meant to be the light of the world. The world is a dark, dreary place and we're meant to be the light of that world. That's our mission, each and every one of us. It's not like a birthday, you get to pick and choose if you have one. Actually, you don't get to pick and choose. Everyone has a birthday, whether you acknowledge it or not, right? The only time you don't have a birthday is when you're six feet under. Birthdays are finished. But we're all justified if we believe. We're all sanctified if we believed. We're all forgiven and set free of our sin. But now we've got a job to do. And the reason we do the job isn't to get into heaven because we're already there. Isn't to get with Jesus and be with the Father. We're already there. Just on our belief. But our belief moves from our old way of life into our new way of life of being Christ to the world. And I've been stewing over this my whole Christian walk. And seriously, in the last two weeks, it's just made sense. Right? And I've gone, oh, because I've looked at the Apostle Paul and go, how did he do it? He is amazing. If only I could live like that. And I've realized what he did. He left his old way of life and he stepped into grace. And he put his grace suit on. And he said, I've done terrible things. But now Jesus has forgiven me. I'm now justified. 
All these things that I knew were coming in Old Testament Scripture, all these prophecies that were going to be fulfilled have now been fulfilled because the Messiah is here and this is now who I am. I'm now a new creation in Him and we've got a job to do. So come on, let's go. And the church just went from strength to strength to strength to strength. And in my personal opinion, and probably is wrong, is that I think the churches are so ineffective because it's full of people trying to grab these things because they sound good, they look good, we agree with them and apply it to our lives and stick it all over us. And we try and live like that, but we fail because we didn't step out of our life. We didn't die to our life. And especially if you grow up in church, it's hard to die to your life that you didn't really know that you had because church has always been your thing. But it's not because you still have a choice. And so many of them walk away. It just breaks your heart, doesn't it? And it's because of the the failure of to step out of your life and into Christ. And we're meant to live in Christ. And that's where all the promises are. That's where the forgiveness is. That's where the justification is. That's where the redemption is. That's where everything is. Or we can be partakers where we just view with our binoculars over here. And we go, yay, let's party. But from a distance, right? And we're actually not even getting involved, but we think we are because we apply a few of them to our life. But we continue on doing what we want to do with our time, with our resources, with everything, with our whole life. It's just what do we want to do? What do we want to do? What are we going to do now? What are we going to do this weekend? Where are we going to go next? What are we going to do? Paul never lived like that. Paul went, where do you want me to go, God? Father, where do you want me to go? Oh, yeah, I'll go to that town and I'll tell them. I'll encourage them. I'll build them up. I'll pray for them. Where do you want me to go, God? Because he got out of this world, his own, and got into Christ. It's the only place that we can be. N.T. Wright says, Paul is not just someone who went about telling people about the gospel. He is someone who embodies it. And I love that. We need to embody Christ. And it's only when we embody Christ that we truly then believe. And if we truly then believe, then we're justified. Then we're sanctified then we're saved. In Christ. But it's got to be in Christ. It can't be from a distance, viewing all the things that look great and that we agree with. Because often when we say we believe, it's because we disagree with what it is that those things say. Yeah, I I agree with that. So yeah, I'd say I believe that. But that's not what belief is actually talking about. So I'd like to invite the team to come back up. And I want to give you all a moment just to reassess where you're at and hopefully all of you have already left that way of living and you've clothed yourself in Christ and you are now justified in him and if you feel like maybe you're not quite there that yet this morning this is your opportunity to get there so you go I'm going to lay down my old way of living I'm going to lay down this old life my views on what it should look like and and get rid of this I can have my own view idea and go to the scripture and go, hey, how does the Apostle Paul view justification? How does the Apostle Paul view new creation? How, why is it so important that he's written so many books in our New Testament for us to read and meditate on? Why is that so important? Because of who he was before and his understanding of the whole big picture and the story. It's vital to us that we learn. This is why we are so passionate about training and equipping people and teaching people the word because those that don't have the knowledge they perished because they look here they look at those things they go I agree with all that that sounds great I'm going to start applying them and do my own thing but we're missing it if we're not taught the word and if we're not taught well because there's a right way and a wrong way to read the Bible and we need to make sure that yep we're going to get things wrong but we need to make sure that we're doing our best every time to get it right. And we're learning those things. So let's just take a moment now and reflect before the Father. Where is it that we stand 
And if you need to move, I said a few weeks ago, I feel like we're on the cusp of having to shift, take another step. And, and this, I believe this is the step that we need to take as a church family. We need to go, man, thank you, God, for your revelation of what it means to live for you. I'm going to step out my life and into yours. And let's do that together. Team leads us in worship.